Welcome to High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by a former National Hockey League player and head coach, Craig McTavish. Craig played 17 seasons in the National Hockey League with the Boston Bruins, Edmonton Oilers, New York Rangers, Philadelphia Flyers, and St. Louis Blues, winning the Stanley Cup four times. He was the last National Hockey League player not to wear a helmet during games. Craig later coached the Oilers from 2000 to 2009. He also served as an assistant coach with the Oilers and the New York Rangers. He coached Team Canada to the 2019 Spangler Cup and also held positions in the KHL and Swiss Elite League. Very, very insightful and interesting conversation that we had with Mac T today talking about his playing career, what it was like and who were the leaders that he looked up to uh, when he first got into the league? Who were the coaches that mentored him? What was it like to play with Wayne Gretzky and the same team with Mark Messier? Finally, what led him into coaching and the advice that he can give to both players and coaches alike. It's a fantastic hour. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mac T. Thanks for joining us, my friend. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Really uh, delighted that we have you on the podcast today. So many unique learning opportunities for our listeners I want to start, though, by going over a little bit of your, of your hockey career, specifically as, as a young player, 17 seasons in the National Hockey League. You were a ninth round, 153rd overall pick. Okay. My question is, what qualities did you feel, whether they were tangible or intangible, that led to such longevity? Again, you were a ninth round pick at the time. Well, the day I was drafted, I remember I was uh, working with my my buddy at a landscaping business, we were sod layers. Wow. You know, so that gave me a lot of motivation. They dropped me off at the job site around 8.30 and just with realist, simple instructions, green side up, we'll see you at five o'clock, you know? So we'd, we'd lay in yeah. that back breaking sod for eight hours. And I got a call later that day that I was drafted by a guy who was the head scout for the Boston Bruins by the name of Gary Darling. I was playing college hockey in uh, New England at the University of Lowell, Division II, and there was a longtime old Bruins scout by the name of John Carlton that at that time scouted collegiately around the New England area. And, you know, now everybody has a guy in that area. It's a hot spot for free agents and you know you have to be there with your pro scouts to look at the drafted players but back in those days he pretty much did it all and he made a case for the Bruins drafting me I got drafted in the ninth round as you mentioned and then uh, I went back to school for another year and then I turned pro looking back at it now what qualities did you feel got you to that that opportunity to the National Hockey League as a player you know, there, there was nowhere near the level of sophistication of the training that you received from a sports science perspective or even from a technical or a tactical perspective from coaches the way the players have it now. Way more sophisticated. I've played at Southwest London. Doug Crossman was in my organization, Brad Marsh. The old Doug Crossman hockey school. I was I was yeah. a participant in that for a long time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. He, we we played junior B together, and Brad Marsh too as well, who was another player that uh, chose not to play the game with a helmet. He lived about uh, half a mile from my house and grew up about half a mile from my house. But you know, there 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 really wasn't that level of sophistication. I was a good hockey player, really good hockey player when I was younger when I was eight, nine, 10. And then I kind of lost a bit of interest in it. I didn't grow much and uh, actually stopped playing when I was probably in about grade nine. Okay. And uh, had a family friend call and convinced me to come back and play. Sure. And uh, so, so then I did. And then I started to develop a little bit more and regain some of the talent that I had as a younger player. And play junior B. Dick Hunter was was my coach in uh, J 
junior B for a year. Is that Dale and, yeah. and Mark? Oh, he's a legend. Dale, Dale and he's Mark, a Mark's legend. Dad. Yeah. Uh, Dale actually played on the team. Mark didn't. Mark was around, but Mark was really young. But he'd come out and practice once in a while. Mark's and Dale's older brother, Ronnie, was on the team. Okay. My brother was a captain of the team. And uh, Doug Crossman was on that team, too. So off that junior B team, there were three guys that had substantial careers in the NHL. But uh, Dick Hunter was the coach. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, so that, that was quite an experience. And we, if you go into the London Knights locker room, there's a picture of that team in uh, Dale's uh, coach's office. Holy cow. My, my good buddy, Doug Burke, who went on and played at uh, Cornell for a lot of years, was on that team too as well. My objective when I was, you know, in early high school was all I wanted to do is play one game in the NHL. Just get me one game in the NHL. And, and that was kind of my motivation. Then I, I, I developed later. And uh, by the time I got to the University of Lowell, I, I was, uh, you know, a pretty decent player. I was supposed to go to Brown University, but I don't know that my academics were suited yeah. to that but so sure. you know i really got scouted in uh by the coach of the university of lowell bill riley who was just an unbelievable influence and uh dick toomey they went okay. together through uh ontario to recruit players and uh originally i was going to go to brown and then uh that fell through and then bill riley took me at the university of lowell and that was really the first time i was ever subjected to higher level coaching dick was a good motivator and stuff like that but he was old school yep. and uh tactically you know he he just you know he was of the volition and it's an important part of the game that you got to play hard yeah and uh you know when i went to the university of lowell bill riley was his uh uncle actually coached the 1960 olympic u.s team Interesting. So it's a, a, he's a real uh, iconic U.S. hockey family, the Rileys. He was great. I still talk to him to, to, to this day. So what a junior B team. Holy cow. That's yeah. uh, uh, unbelievable talent. Take us now in, in your, your early careers in the National Hockey League. So who were some players, uh, whether it was with Boston or Edmonton, that took you under their wing? And, and what were the leadership qualities that you'd admired in them at the time? Well, the captain of the Bruins at that time was a guy by the name of Wayne Cashman, who you'll remember. He was just a fantastic person. He, remember back in those days, I came in to the Bruins in 1979. There was a lot of hazing and initiations for young players, you know, yeah. pretty horrific stuff when you look back at it. Yep. I mean, I don't think it was too mean spirited at the time, but Wayne Cashman was a guy that didn't believe in any of that. So he was way ahead of his time there. And he said, we're not, we're not doing it. So I was never subjected to any of that stuff, but he, he, he was a great leader. I lived with a guy when I first went to uh, Binghamton, which was the American league affiliate of the Bruins back in 1979 by the name of Tom song, okay. who really had a great influence on me. He, his uncle, actually, Butch Songen, was the quarterback of the Patriots, Holy the New England Patriots. So he was, he, he was, came from an athletic New England family. I mean, he went to Boston College. He played baseball there. I think he had the home run record in baseball. But he, he really had a uh, significant influence on me. But outside of that, in terms of mentorship, I think the game really was my mentorship. And sure. the game is what, uh, you know, I, I, I like the game. I wanted to make a career of it. And so that, that really, the game itself really guided me. How about at the time uh, and the coaches that helped guide? You mentioned that, the, that every level that you stepped up, there was a tech, technical and tactical. There, there were differences, obviously. Were there certain coaches throughout your career, specifically as a young player that, you know, on down when we look past uh, your, your playing career, into coaching that you kind of emulated or, or or were really happy that you played under, had the opportunity to play under? Well, I think everybody, 
You know, you, oh. you, you, you always take things from your experiences. And it wasn't until I got to Edmonton that I realized that I would, you know, get into coaching when my career was over. That, that's the last couple of years that I signed in Edmonton with uh, the Oilers and Glenn Sather, I always had a coaching component to the last year of my deal. Okay, you've got this year to play, and then you've got two years that will sign for you to start coaching here. So I always kind of, at that point, I really started to pay attention. Okay. And, uh, you know, I kept a book that I still have today of drills that work for me as a player that I liked a lot. The Oilers ran unbelievable practices back in the late 80s and the early 90s. John Muckler, Ted Green, Glenn Sather. I mean, we had more of a Russian influence in the way that we played, the way that we moved the puck, the way that we practiced. I mean, the practices in a lot of ways were more entertaining to watch than the, than the games because all those situations, the way they could move the puck and you know, it couldn't help but develop players like myself and, you know, players that, you know, weren't at that skill level. Like I would say a couple guys like Marty McSorley okay, uh, from practicing at that tempo and that pace and those expectations of the execution, the play execution, Dave Brown, the same way. I mean, these guys were really tough, but, uh, and, and they were pretty good players too, but I really think if you ask those guys, and I've obviously talked to Marty about it, Locks and Brownie, that uh, you know that, that to to practice and play at that temple really helped in their evolution as as players and their development as players, you know. But the practices were, and I remember the guys loved to practice. Like the thing about Gretz is he. He loved to play, loved to practice, like just all kinds of life and energy in his face and practice. And why wouldn't you love to practice when you, if, if, if you're that good? Sure. And the, you think he was good in the games, you should have seen him in practice. I mean, they, the, he was just unbelievable talent. And uh, the things he used to do in practice were incredible. Taking us back to practice, you said that you, it was kind of a, a Russian influence. Was that at the time? Uh, the Tarasov era, was that the way it was played, tic-tac-toe, reading the open ice? Is that the emulation kind of that you were referring to, the big uh, Canada-Russia that, series? That's right. That's right. E exactly. Tikhanov actually was a okay. coach back in those days. But it was a puck possession, passing. Until then, you really seldomly re-attacked, aborted the attack, circled back, collected again, and then tried to attack again, which, you know, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, obviously there's some risk in it if, if, if you don't execute the plays, but uh, the passing part of the game to me has always been the most visually uh, pleasing part of the game. And the thing that I like the most is teams that can really throw the puck around. I have a philosophy that, uh, that I, I think would be backed up by the analytics, but I haven't checked it. But I, you know, completed passes during the game. How many passes are completed during the game? You see that a lot in soccer. They track that stat. And I think in hockey, I think it would bear itself out too as well. The most completed passes generally wins the game. And I would say the teams that are the weakest complete the least amount of passes but i think that's maybe you know more about that than i do no that that's that's all real interesting i was always drawn to that the tikhanov era and that tarasov and looking at old tapes of how they prepared their athletes and then watching the old tapes and it was just at the time a stark contrast to the technical and tactical elements creating space depth attacking with speed as opposed to and you would uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the more north to south style. Absolutely. It was very interesting to watch. Also, I believe my father at the time told me those practices were a thing to watch, right? Did Were, were, there, were there not large out, uh, uh, crowds? Did they practice in the mall? Is that where they? We, we did occasionally. We had a uh, retail 
arrangement with West Edmonton Mall. That, where that's it. We we had our store there, and uh, for that we had to go there and practice once a month. But you, you're right about the Russians. When I first went to the KHL to coach there, the first thing I did was read Tarasov's book, and I mean, way ahead of his time. Way ahead, way of, his ahead time. of his time. Just and way ahead. The contrast between he and Tikhanov was immense. I think Tarasov was a guy that uh, really cared about the players and really had a great relationship with the players. When Fedosov was coming over here, something happened and he, he, he was out of hockey for a bit. And he ended up going back to Russia and he sought out Tarasov and Tarasov trained him. And some of the things he was doing were, you know, as you said, way, way ahead of the time. And Tikhanov, I think, I mean, he, he was uh, hard, 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 like mean, cruel. Yes. Yep. Would not let the players socialize with their families or, you know, it, it, like really awful stuff, actually, from what I've heard. And, uh, I mean, he, he was blessed with the best players. I'm not sure. I mean, you can't argue his results, but uh, sure. you, you can't argue either that somebody else with a little bit more collaborative approach wouldn't have a better, a better record or at least as good a record. Sure. Take us, you, you mentioned Wayne Gretzky and you said, you know, he practiced as, 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 as well as he played. Could you take the listener behind the scenes? I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, looking at your career, you played three years with Wayne. Is that right? Three, in Edmonton? Or am I, am, did I mis, miscalculate? How, 85, how, 86, 86, 87. 87, 8, 88. Yeah, three years. Okay. Yeah. Take yeah. us, uh, like, obviously, he, he had a sixth sense. I mean, he's, he, he's seeing plays. He's being in areas uh, that, that, that others, uh, you know, were two steps behind. What was it like witnessing his talents? And were there any talents that, that maybe the casual fan, or not the casual, but the fan would not be able to see behind the scenes? Was he you know, intense about X, intense about Z. What were special qualities aside the fact that obviously he was touched by the wand of God? <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Just the sense the guy had was, you know, you listen to him talk now and have for years, just how, how brilliant he is. And, uh, I mean, that really translated on the ice. All the Gretzky's are sharp guys very sharp guys and they're all i call it the wally principle you know they all really have a good understanding of uh blue collar values and doing what's right like they they really have an instinctive understanding of how to treat people and to treat people well go out of your way wayne was unbelievable in that respect and, but from from his the on ice part of it, I mean, just crazy the way he processed the game. Like he, you would go, like I just like you'd be on a two on one with him, and it, it would be on your stick at the most appropriate time with the best chance to put it in the net every time. And it was just amazing to me that how, how can you pass it through somebody every single time. And, but he did. And, uh, you know, I asked him how, how he did it. I don't know. He just looked for a hole, and, but it, his hockey sense and his playmaking ability was, uh, incredible. I think the best example of his hockey sense and how he processed the game is the time I saw him call too many men on the ice with the puck. <laughs> what take us, tell me this. I want to hear the story. Yeah, like he's he had the puck and he just processed where everybody was on the ice. And he had allotted for five of the opposition and he knows that it's that this area should be open. And then he goes to throw it, he sees another guy and he stops and calls too many men on the ice with the puck. Unbelievable. Like, I, mean, I, I knew it was unfair then. <laughs> Unbelievable. Let me ask you another yeah. question, piggybacking on that. And I don't want to ask you a loaded question, but hockey sense, is that something like 
is that, can you teach that? Like, can you teach that by watching video? Like I always, it, I, I don't want to say easy. That's the wrong word, but as strength and conditioning coaches or as performance coaches, the low hanging fruit is, 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 is getting someone stronger, right? Getting someone faster. That's the hardware. The software element is, can you teach someone where to be? I'm not suggesting that anyone can process the game like Wayne Gretzky, but from your experience, is that something that you can coach or improve on? Or is it, hey, you've reached the National Hockey League. <laughs> you know, this is this is your cap. Yeah, I think good coaches are able to maximize the the potential of the players. And I think you start with a realistic expectation of what the capability is. And good coaches will frame a game for each player and have them work within that frame. And that frame is their capability, their maximum performance level within that frame. And you can improve on it, but only to a certain degree. Like the, the other guy that's got unbelievable hockey sense is Leon Dreisaitl. When I see players that find plays that I don't see in the press box, you know, so you see a couple options. Okay, it's over there, and then he finds a third option or a fourth option that I don't see in the press box. That's rare. I mean, Mark Savard, remember him? He, he oh, had yeah. unbelievable. Oh, he yeah. had unbelievable hockey sense. He could find people that I didn't see. And I mean, that's all in the processing ability. But you try and frame a game for a guy based on his capability and and uh I think that you know really maximizes the performance level of the individual, which in my mind is the number one objective of the of the uh, coach. Well put, Mac. Another one of your of your former teammates. I want to speak specifically of his qualities that we possess, which was unbelievable leadership. Obviously, the person I'm referring to is Mark Messier. You won a Stanley Cup with Mark in New York, correct? That, right. That, yeah. that year. Obviously, you hear him interviewed, so well-spoken, so polished, uh, dotting I's, crossing T's. Why was he such a good leader? Maybe that's a better question. Why? Well, I think product of the environment. Like, he grew up in a real hockey family. His dad, Doug, was an educator, a teacher, a coach, tough guy, passionate guy, classy guy. His mother was an unbelievable person. Their family was super close. I think they, I know they talk a lot of hockey around the dinner table and stuff like that. So he grew up with it and an understanding of the game. And he had an unbelievable infectious personality that people just wanted to be around. Like he was a lot of fun. He had a well-rounded personality. He knew when to have fun. He knew when to bear down and uh, play the game. He knew when the team needed a kick in the rear end. He could do it uh, in the dressing room with a few words, or he could do it by example on the ice. You know, he he had an intensity level that is really rare in the NHL because he had the power, he had the speed, he had the finesse, and he had the physical play and toughness. So there's not much in the game of hockey, many aspects in the game of hockey that he couldn't help and effect. And, uh, you know, it it didn't take him long to send a message in a shift that it's time to get going. And uh, he he was, uh, you know, and so so much fun to be around, he and his family. Um, You won four Stanley Cups. You know, obviously, for any team to win a Stanley Cup, you have to have an immense talent, obviously. Were there any things looking back now of, from a cultural standpoint that you thought were really special with those teams? Did they, was it everybody bonded together at the right time? Was it a different of personalities? Was it a coach that really let players play free? Was there anything that the kind of, they say success leaves result uh, or success leaves clues. Is there anything that you can look back on from a culture standpoint that all of those teams possessed? Well, I, I think all of that, our best beat everybody else's best. The talent factor was, there for sure the Oilers if you remember really tapped into the Finnish market long before yep it was uh popular I mean 
they, they leveraged a competitive, huge competitive advantage there in yep. some of the players that they got out of, uh, out of Finland that were so good. Obviously, Yari Curry, Estetikin, and oh, yeah. Rail Rusalainen, you know, they're, they're, and, and Maddie Hag, all the, like they, they were tapped into the Finnish market. So it was a competitive advantage. And, you know, they hit on Wayne Gretzky. They hit on Mark Messier late. They hit on Glenn Anderson late. What do you mean by hit on them late? What do you mean by that? Late round draft choices. Oh, sorry. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Hit late round choices. I mean, those guys are all Hall of Fame players and later draft choices. Sure. So a tribute to Barry Frazier and his staff for sure. But, you know, the team had, knew how to win. And yep. I mean, they learned how to win before I got to Edmonton. They'd won two Stanley Cups, but they knew how to win and how to turn it on and how important structure was. And then combined with great coaching. I sure. mean, Glenn, Glenn Sather was a great uh, head coach, role model, could really, um, you know, was good at when you were going, you were going to play. And when you weren't, obviously, Yep. The first two lines are going to play, but the third and fourth line, there was always competition to see who was going to be playing in the third when the game was on the line. And he did a good job uh, managing all that. John Muckler was, you know, oh. an unbelievable tactical coach, really ahead of his time in terms of his video preparation and the way that yeah. he analyzed the game. And that was back in the days that you used to splice tapes together. Yeah. So, it wasn't easy to cut the games. And we had a video guy by the name of Bob Freeman who worked in a little room and smoked a pack of cigarettes in that little ah. room. Just off. And I mean, the guy was a big, tough guy. Nobody was going to tell him to stop smoking. Uh, but they'd be in that environment, cutting tape. And, you know, we didn't watch a lot of video till we in preparation for the playoffs and so forth. But great leadership. You know, Wayne, Mark, Kevin, incredible leaders and uh, great talent. And Glenn was really good at getting a lot out of his role players, like Kevin yes. McClellan's of the world. And Marty McSorley came in and played great. But he, he and a lot of that was a byproduct, as I said earlier, the practices and so yep. forth. But Calgary was good, too. I mean, it was it was a tough battle between us and Calgary. but. That our team was pretty darn good. Oh yeah, uh, seven players in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, last player, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Last player in the National Hockey League to not wear a helmet. Yeah, that belongs to you, my friend. Yeah. My question is, joking of course, but aside yeah. from the equipment changes, how's the game changed now? Since your last National Hockey League game, is it speed? Is it puck sense? Is it, are the athletes faster, stronger? Is it everything in between? How's the game changed? I think it's speed for sure. Puck sense, I would argue. I'd say that's lateral. It's, it's not as physical, but it's more dangerous now. Like from when I played, you'd be out there you know, kind of waiting for something to happen before you'd get the full speed. And, uh, you know, you'd be like a shark out there, then a play would break and then you'd get going to full speed. But today, you know, really the shifts are shorter. You're expected yep. to be at full speed pretty much the whole time you're out there, whether you're going on offense or whether you're coming back on defense. I mean, today, the most dangerous guy is the guy that's coming behind you. And not yeah. the guy in front of you. It's a bit different game, but it's not, you know, it's the same game because the same mistakes are made in the same critical areas at the same critical times that, you know, are the difference between wins and losses. So the game hasn't changed in that regard, but the makeup of the personnel has changed and the philosophy about short shifts and full speed at all times. Fantastic. I want to pivot if I could here. Coaching, 
you talked earlier in our interview about this idea towards, you know, the latter end of your playing career, you thought, you, you know, you might have an, an itch for coaching or if that was a logical next step. What led you to that idea of, hey, you know, was it just not natural for you to say, hey, I want to be involved in the game. I want to coach. Was it an aha moment? Like, did you consider other careers after hockey or, or was it always coaching? Well, the guys I saw that translated transition best from playing to the next phase of their career. And, and that's really the, the biggest challenge that players have. The money now makes that transition not as uh, urgent or essential because you have or should have, if you manage your resources well, you should have the financial capability that you have the flexibility to do mostly what you want. You know, back when I played that, you had to transition into do, doing something else for sure. And yep. uh, the people that transitioned best were always the people that got some other training, whether mm -hmm. it was a law degree or a business degree. And when I was in Philadelphia, I wrote something called the GMAT to get in to, to write my MBA. And I was accepted at a couple the University of Alberta, University of Western Ontario. And uh, that was going to be my plan when I was done playing. I retired in St. Louis. I was going to go to the University of Alberta, take an MBA there, and then branch out and do something else. And I was following along that path. And then I got a call later in the summer from uh, Bobby Smith, who was running the Coyotes back in those days okay. in Phoenix. And so I went and I interviewed in Phoenix. And uh, then I started thinking about coaching again and getting right into it. And then I talked to the New York Rangers, who uh, I played for in 94. And they offered me a job on the coaching staff for, for the Rangers that I took. And I was in coaching for like, 12, 13 years before I finally got to go back to school where I went back to Queens, Queens University and took an MBA in Queens. Great experience. But the coaching, I got, I got into that and enjoyed it. Was in New York for a couple of years under Colin Campbell the first year and then John Muckler came in. Yes. And then I left there after two years and went to Edmonton to work under Kevin Lowe. Okay. Who took over in Edmonton for a year. And then Glenn left as GM out of Edmonton. Kevin went up to GM. I went up to coach. I brought Billy Moores and Charlie Huddy with me, who were, I worked with both in New York. And we were there for 10 years. Had various other guys that went through. Craig Simpson was there the year we went to the finals. Did a fantastic job. Mark Lamb, Kelly Buckberger. You know, it was, they were great years because we had a lot of friendship Yep. amongst the staff. We had players that had tremendous amount of character, toughness. We could bring the game to the opposition. We didn't always win, but we could take the game to the opposition. Our talent level was decent. Our depth was excellent. Uh, we had Sean Horkoff, who was really good yep. for me. and. Ryan Smith and Alex Hemsky, they were our first line. And I mean, those guys, they would fight to the death. You know, they were great competitors. And a lot of the real great role players that we had, Ethan Morrow, Todd Marchand, who was traded for me when I went to New York in 1994. He came to the Oilers and then he was a great player for the Oilers. That was a great line. And Mike Greer. Yep. Was on the right side. Jared Stoll, Matt Green, you know, some players Chris Pronger, for sure. We went to the finals. We had some we had some good uh good players and 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 great characters. Mm -hmm. And very seldom got out work. There are real I mean the culture we talked you talked a bit about the culture and what you gave me to prepare for this and you know, the culture really was about three things and has always been about three things for the Oilers. 
you know, hard work. You can't do anything without hard work. Cooperation, you know, cooperate with your staff, with your coaching staff. You know, you're not at odds with one another. You cooperate with the, uh, the support staff, the medical staff. That was the culture of the championship era. Like those guys were treated like players. Barry Stafford, uh, Kenny Lowe, Peter Miller, Sparky Kolchiski. Like those guys were, you know, they, they were not treated any differently than a member of the playing team. And so cooperation with your staff and the last good humor, like have some fun, you know, like, and, and Glenn was good at, you know, one thing I think he was really good at is he had a lot of interests outside of the game and he encouraged that. And now you can get so pigeonholed on hockey that life passes you by. You know, I think he was always of the benefit of the belief that you were really benefited by having external interests. So he never minded that we'd go skiing at the all-star break, ride our snowmobiles from our houses over to Glen's, and he'd go with us snowmobiling. He, he was a hunter. We'd arrange hunting trips where we'd go up to Hardesty and the east of uh, Alberta and have goose shoots and, you know, ducks and, you know, all that kind of stuff that gets you away from the game a bit. Yeah. Because the game, especially in a market like Edmonton, can be so frigging suffocating for these players that, you know, you, you have to be able to get away. And now the schedule is so crazy. You know, the way with, I, I with COVID think, and everything with, with, is this, with COVID, you just... yeah, COVID has really made it difficult. Like I, the Oilers have like 37 games left in 74 days. Like, I mean, that's insane. And to, to me, my overriding view of the game is there's too many games. You know, it's about revenue. I know that I'm not naive to the fact we're in the pro hockey business, but I think there could be a better work life balance there for the players. If they, you know, the owners took a bit less, the players took a little bit less. I don't think the fans would care because there's a lot, the games are expensive, you know, a lot, a lot of games for the fans. If we shorten the season again, uh, in the number of games, I think it'd be much more enjoyable and uh, it'd be a better product, I think, on the ice too as well. But that's it. That's I'm going down another tangent no. there. What Speaking of um, work-life balance, what were your passions or what are your passions away from the game? Well, in coaching, there's not a lot of room for much away from the game, as you know. I mean, your brother Misha's in it and uh i mean he he can do an amazing amount of work that guy like he's one of the most efficient guys i've ever been around the stuff that he it take me hours to spit out those practice plans and he can break down a game in half an hour like i mean it's probably a product of necessity for him because <laughs> he, he's pretty social character sure but the efficiency he has is incredible but you know, generally the, I mean, I don't think coaching is a lot of fun in the NHL anymore. I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, most of the coaches, they love it. They would never admit this, but it's a, a mercenary job. The pressures on coaches and the things you have to deal with, the, the interpersonal relationships you have to have with everybody, the, the scrutiny you get externally the expectations i mean it's i i used to say you know you know you're doing a good job when the players hate you because you're too hard uh management thinks you're incompetent because you're too soft and you're not talking to your wife because you're never at home you know that's oh. the perfect balance that's, gee money christmas it sounds lonely eh? it sounds lonely <laughs> That's the perfect balance. 
you got to apply a lot of time to it. So you're not around the house that much. You know, you're the one guy that can make the players do things that ordinarily wouldn't want to do. And, uh, you know, the, the, the other fundamental issue is for coaches, you know, you're really defined by your shortcomings. And I, I saw that, that here with Dave Tippett. You know, you just disregard and take for granted everything these guys do well. And, you, you know, the fundamental problem with coaching is it's incredibly hard to do and incredibly easy to criticize. <laughs> And just, know, just look on social, it, look, just look on social yeah. media, Mac T everyone's, everyone's an expert. Yeah. Why all these haters out here? Why is everybody so angry? I, I think it's a, a big, bigger problem, but it's, it's a big problem in the uh, sports business. Everybody's on it. Like, and it's, you're, you're reading things from people that have no idea and it's impacting what you do. Like I even, all the players for sure you can't like Miko Koskinen the other day said you know he tries not to be, read the social media he was under a lot of duress here for a few weeks based on uh you know performance level of the team but he said you just can't get away from it it's just you open your email or google and it's right there in front of you so it's I mean I think it's a big problem and uh I don't think there's enough journalists that, you know, fight back on it. Interesting. All interesting. In terms of the players now, you mentioned just, just recently or just now social media. You, you literally just finished coaching. You were in uh, Russia. You were in Switzerland. Is there a difference or do you handle millennials, Gen Z, Gen Z, whatever you want to call it, different than players of the 80s 90s is it a totally oh. different time is it a totally different ath athlete and if so if you do have a difference what is the difference how, how do you how do you navigate that landscape well i don't differentiate between gen z and millennials really okay um small difference there i would say but gen z and the millennials are quite a bit different than the baby boomers Back when I played, it was more of a dictatorial relationship between mm -hmm. the player and the coach. You know, you're doing this, you're doing it. Okay, we're going here, we're going to travel here, this is when we leave. Thank you, sir, may I have another? You know, that was the attitude <laughs> that, that you had. And today, it's a, uh, you know, collaboration for sure. If you want to maximize the level of buy-in and subsequently the execution. If you get heavy buy-in, you're gonna get better execution. So you have to be strategic in things that you're introducing to the group. And I think most coaches are like that. Not all coaches are like that, but if, if the players are included and there's a fine line there because you want the input, but it can't be limitless. And uh, there's a real fine line between too little and too much. So you have to walk that balance. You're in a better position if your players know why you're doing it, not just doing it. And uh, you're going to get a better level of buy-in. I think Daryl Sutter is a guy who's more, more of a dictator. Yes. Maybe the dictator is a bad word, but he's but he gets a lot out of his players because I mean the old Machiavellian uh, theory: better to be feared than loved. There's some of that to it, sure for sure. You know, you want to treat everybody well, but some people will take advantage of that. Familiarity breeds contempt, <laughs> too. So if you're always communicating, you're gonna you're gonna uh, yeah, I mean, it's there's there's a lot to it for sure. But to answer your question, it's definitely more of a collaboration. Daryl Sutter, I think, has done an unbelievable job this year in Calgary. But uh, Jay Woodcroft, who just took over here, is a real yep. collaborator. And uh, but he's relentless in coaching. You get what you insist on. Huh. If you don't like insist on it. 
if there's gray area there, there there's going to be, you know, there, there, it's, 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 it's not going to be executed to the level that you want. You need, you need to insist on things to get them. I really like that. You get what you insist on. And, it, and I've, I've used this uh, quite a bit with a lot of the, the individuals that we've had the opportunity, coaches and players, you've had the opportunity to interview. They said, you know, coaching is very similar to parenting. At a young age, a directive approach is warranted. At an older age, if you take that same approach, you might lose a lot of people, a cooperative approach. I think the balance there is, it, like as you mentioned before, is you want to cooperate, but there is a point where you have to make a decision and it might not be the decision that everybody wants, but at the same time, as long as the individuals know the why behind it and where they're going with it, perhaps that, that, that breeds a, a, a better culture in the end. Yeah. And, and just to be direct. Yes. Even when you're delivering bad information, players, if you're telling players, they're not going to play. Like I was always of the belief the head coach should be doing that. I don't think many people do it anymore. You post a list. And the players deal with it. But I never wanted the player to go back and say, I don't know why I'm not playing. They don't talk to me. And so, but it's not a pleasurable task at the end of your morning skate, skating around and telling a guy you're not playing in the game. You know, you're, you're going to stay out here and you're going to skate hard and work on your game with, uh, you know, one of the assistant coaches. But, you know, at least you have that forced discussion with the guys. So he may not like what he's or not going to like what you're telling him, but at least you're telling him. And I mean, there's always some tough scratches along the line of the year where, you know, you scratch a veteran and John Muckler used to say, you know, when things are going bad, time to sit out a veteran. You know, just yeah. Cause it gets the attention of everybody else. Well, you know, like, not an easy discussion, it, though. <laughs> not, not an easy, easy discussion. Not, a discussion. No. not at all. No. Yeah. No. And uh, I used to have to tell the veteran, too, when I coached with Mike. He wouldn't tell him. I'd have to tell him. <laughs> but anyways, when I coached with Mike in New York, when he was a head coach, we're going to sit out Kevin Stevens. You tell him, Mac. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. But that that type of stuff, but it's it's hard. There's a lot of hard things that you have to do in the game. Take me, if you if you would, on your opinion here, um, in terms and measures of analytics. We've seen an explosion. I, we can speak on performance metrics, whether it's force plate measurements, GPS measurements, whether it's the eye in the sky, behind the scenes breaking down video, whether it's all the analytics, Corsi, I. I Three quarters of them, I'm not even aware of Mac T. I, I, you know, yeah. Where does that fit for you in your coaching career? Did you I specifically towards the end of your coaching career, like you know, the last few years, did you rely on metrics to make decisions, or was it, hey, you know, they informed us, but I went with my gut. I, I would say they informed us. I think you have to pay attention to it. I mean, it's always got to par be part of your decision making. The game today is broken down into thousands of events. And uh, then you aggregate those events and sort those events. And they generally lead you to obvious conclusions. Generally. I mean, yeah. there's always outliers that force you to examine a certain aspect of your game. Why are we not? Why are we? 22nd in zone entries. Why are we not being able to carry the puck in the zone as well as the other teams? You know, so it forces you to ask questions of your team that you you might otherwise not ask and examine. And it also, when you're presenting things to your team, it's a way to add credibility to your message yes through the aggregation of all these these events i talked before about number of completed passes and uh, as being uh, a good indicator of team strength i think the best teams can pass best as i said 
And conversely, the best teams, every pass is contested. You know, like every pass goes through something. There's very seldom open passing lanes when you're playing the best teams in the league. Yes. Every, even on the power play, those pucks are going through sticks at all times. And uh, I mean, to me, that's a great measure of defense. I mean, that stuff's important. You know, all the passing stats for your defensemen, carries, completed passes in the uh, defensive zone. And then you can pull up when you're evaluating people and players, you pull up a list of players that complete the highest percentage of passes in the defensive zone. Give me a list of all the players in the league from the guy that does the most to the guy that does the least, the highest percentage to the least percentage. And then so they'll spit out all these players and invariably there'll be somebody in there that doesn't belong. And so it leads you to go, why is this guy in amongst Duncan Keith and Drew Doughty and, and Morgan Riley and, all these guys that you know to be superstars. So and it, like tactical things that you would use analytics for, it's good for player evaluation. I think as, as a manager, it always has to be part of the process. You know, when you're trying to acquire players, it always has to be part of the process that you have to check off the analytics department on their evaluation of this player to see it, if it jives with what you're feeling, what your pro scouts are feeling and what your eyes are seeing. And, uh, you know, if that doesn't jive, then you got to do a deeper dive. I'm not saying you wouldn't make the deal based on analytics, but you wouldn't do it without investigating it further. Well put last portion here of our, our interview, but I just, just some general advice for young aspiring coaches, is there any general advice that you could give them in terms of, you know, your path or, you know, if they're, if they're a young coach, perhaps they want to coach major midget, perhaps they want to coach in the USHL, any advice that you could give looking back uh, throughout your career? I think you want maximum activity and practice. You want to be organized and you want your staff organized. And you want an efficiency and a level of professionalism to your practices that is going to be obvious to your players. And it sends a clear message to your players. So you, you want to maximize the time and the ice surface. I mean, yeah, there are times that you're going to have to, if you're coaching midget and doing uh, tactical things and special team things, you're going to have to slow the practice down in one end but try and keep a maximum of activity going. Try and design drills that you can build from. So there's a familiarity there. So you're not at the board the whole time. I think that's really important. As you get progressed through minor hockey, there's a tactical and technical balance there. I mean, your technical balance would be all your your uh, technical skills, your puck handling, your shooting, your skating, your edge work, and then the tactical part. The technical part would obviously be much higher as you're younger than the tactical part, but eventually the tactical part starts to come up. You have to be mindful of a balance between the tactical and technical part of the practice. I think that helps maximize the performance level of the team. And the other part that you need to be uh, aware of is the criticism. You're going to take, it's a thankless job because as I said, nobody's going to say, you know, you do this, 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 and this. Well, the parents are going to criticize you for whatever reason, whether their son doesn't play as much or, you know, because everybody has an opinion about hockey, especially here in Canada. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter your level of experience in the game. Your opinion is equally strong, whether you devoted your life to it or not. And you can't ever take the criticism personally. You know it's coming. 
you have to listen to it because maybe there's an opportunity to learn and evolve and some of it is warranted and you can think about it or talk to your staff about it, but you have to be prepared for it and that you can't have thin skin there when dealing with the inevitable criticism. You, you hear, you go to every rink, you see the parents that aren't happy and okay, we're not doing this right. But you know what people generally don't realize in the game of hockey for every action that you take, there's an equal and opposite yeah. reaction, yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah. Yep. We're not aggressive enough on the forecheck. Okay. We we don't have enough guys above the puck on the on defense. And, you know, everything you tweak something somewhere, we're gonna stretch. Okay, well, we don't have enough guys in the defensive zone. And so that the game is very strategic. And uh winning hockey is really strategic. You gotta understand that most of these people they mean well, they don't have a clue. <laughs> Uh, but and you're going to get criticized and it's going to be you know you're donating all your time I feel bad for whenever I go see a minor hockey game I'm always complimentary to the coach because I'm so thankful that they take that amount of time out of their lives to dedicate themselves to the job but it's it's not easy at any level but it can be very satisfying and you see players down the road that you've coached that come and you know, you have a good conversation with and they'll say something positive about the impact you had. I mean, that's that's where you get the uh, that's where you get the, the satisfaction. What about Mac T advice for young hockey players? Anything that you could uh, that you could recommend based on your experiences? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there, there's a balance to to everything that's available to them. They don't want to get so committed to it that uh, they lose sight of other things or don't want their parents to be so committed to it that they can't get away from it a little bit. I always thought, you know, you, you and I always played two or three sports. Now you yep. kind of specialize. Do I really think that helps? I don't know. I mean, maybe marginally, but you need your time away from the game now. Yep. I mean, I think the, the draft choices, the top draft choices in the NHL, it's just crazy what they go through in their draft year, especially the top six or seven or 10, like the, the, the camps and the, the, the combines and the interviews and the Team Canada camps. And it's just, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's a lot. Development camps, all those things. Everybody's looking to be able to sell in their organization in the NHL that they're progressive. But I think sometimes it's, it can be counterproductive if it's too much that they don't get a break from it. and yep. you can uh, short circuit them mentally and try and you can take some of the enjoyment away from playing the game that they have by having structure. Because I mean, it's it's a lot for a 20, 21 year old to have your life on an itinerary seven days a week, 30 days a month. <laughs> Absolutely. What's next for you, Mac T? What what are you are you, are do you, do you plan uh in some capacity to get back into coaching? You're in Edmonton now. What's what's next for you? Yeah. Oh, I'm as I said to you before we went on air, I'm bored. It's the <laughs> first time I've ever been around the winter without being fully employed. I, I do some stuff with Sportsnet now. Yep. Analysis with Sportsnet on the Euler games, which I enjoy. But I'm always looking to do something else, whether it's in the game or outside of the game. Uh, I'm not ready to ride off into the sunset just yet. And uh, hopefully I can uh, find something that's, that's engaging. One last question. Leaving the game, how would you like Craig McTavish to be remembered? Like leaving the game, like just a, a fan. I had the opportunity, a very small window, to have a chance to talk with you at the Spangler Cup. And I was so impressed. Number one, taking the time. Number two, very highly, highly educated, massively impressive uh, hockey acumen. I, I mean, it was just a, a pleasure to just to get a small sliver uh, into your uh, of your time and, and, and to be able to chat with you. 
I came away thinking, wow, what a well-educated hockey man. And, and how would you want people who don't know you to be remembered, if that makes any sense, Mac? Yeah. It uh, boils down to really uh, one thing. I, I want to be remembered as a actually two things. Somebody who is very loyal and somebody who is a good teammate. Collaborated, worked well in the group, had respect for people. And uh, as I said before, you know, really being a good teammate is a, a vastly underrated quality in the moment. And I think that uh, the lesson that I would say and how I'd like to be remembered is the older we get, you know, when we get together as a group and a team, the older we get, the less it matters how good a player you were. Nobody cares 20 years later how good you were, but everybody cares how good a teammate you were. And I think. You know, yeah, we're all a bit self-centered. It's a human instinct, self-survival. But you have to be able to put that aside and do things that are good for the group, support people. And that's the thing that really stands the test of time is how good you were with your teammates because they might may not remember you scored 25 goals, but they'll remember how good a teammate you were. So to me, that's the most important thing. Our guest today has been Craig McTavish, Mac T. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been my pleasure. 